Hey everybody, Stu Smith here, going live. Going to be taking some questions here in a minute, but I couldn't resist um, not coming on and um, talking a little bit about the change of seasons because it is almost springtime here in Maryland, finally. We may have a few more cold days, but we have endured the winter lift cycle that was all outdoors due to COVID. Thanks, COVID. Um, but you know what? It was a lot of fun. We actually um, got through it, came up with some new ideas um, with training, such as our three to one ratio, which worked really well for those guys who are trying to maintain PST scores. It actually worked so well. Some guys were actually faster and were, did better on their PT scores. So um, and the way we did that was we did three weeks of strength training, followed by one week of uh, calisthenics and cardio. So we took a week off of strength and just focused on calisthenics and cardio. Did that all winter. So I think we wound up doing one, two, three, four, four cycles of that. We're on our fourth one right now. Um, so I think this is our second or third week of the last cycle of strength training and then we'll uh, transition right into more calisthenics and cardio we may wind up just playing around with a three to one ratio in reverse so i guess you could say a one to three ratio where you do one week of strength training followed by three weeks of calisthenics training all summer calisthenics and running progression um just test that out so it works so well in the winter we're going to see how it works in the summer normally what we do is if we needed to supplement some weight training with our calisthenics and running cycle is we would do a second workout in the day and it would be a swim workout followed by a quick maybe 30 minute weight room supplement. So whatever muscle groups we worked in the morning, we would work in the afternoon, early afternoon with uh, the same muscle group. So for instance, we did pull-ups and push-ups in the morning. We would do bench press, rows, pull-downs, you know, bicep, tricep type stuff, some shoulder work in there just to balance that out. Same for leg days. If we were running and doing squats and lunges with calisthenics, we would do, um, you know, some squats and deadlifts, uh, weighted lunges. <clears throat> but, you know, if you could always add weight vest to your calisthenics if you just want to make your calisthenics day a little bit harder as well. So anyway, that is how... Um, we go through each season focusing a little bit differently on the elements of fitness that work well together. So when we think about all the elements of fitness that a tactical athlete needs to do well in, they are strength and power, speed and agility, muscle stamina and endurance, flexibility, mobility, grip. Um, and then in that endurance zone you can put run swim ruck to whatever degree you know you need depending upon your branch of service or job you're going into so there's a lot to absorb and it's hard to get good at all of those all at once in fact it's almost impossible so for instance if you're trying to get stronger it's hard to get faster <clears throat> now there's nothing wrong with getting stronger and maintaining your running distances and pace, um, but it, it's hard to do both at the same time. Same for running. You know, typically if you're trying to lift heavy on legs and you're trying to run faster, you will typically not get better at either. You just kind of flat out, you know, just kind of plateau there. So mixing elements of fitness that work well together. Think about football training. You would work on speed, agility, power, strength. All of those work really well together. You know, they build the power athlete. <clears throat> and then you have the muscle stamina, cardio endurance, all of those, you know, those, you know, speed, you know, different speeds in that zone, whether it's, you know, 
endurance, uh, long, slow distance stuff to build a foundation or it's goal pace stuff or it's more interval, high, high intensity stuff, you know, anaerobic, aerobic. Um, all of those energy systems need to be uh, part of your um, programming as well. So there's a lot to juggle, right? And getting good at all of them doesn't come by a single, um, you know, by a single workout. It usually takes a system that will get you good at all of those over the course of a year. So that's why I have the seasonal tactical fitness periodization program. And as I tell everybody, it's a way to train, not the way to train um, or the only way to train. <clears throat> but it works. I've been doing it for 21, 22 years now. Um, highly recommend considering it. And it doesn't have to be my training programs. It just has to be like those blocks. You take a strength program from anywhere, do it during your strength training. Take a running program from anywhere, put it into your running and calisthenics, spring and summer training. Move those around like that and you'll see big results. They typically go real well together. Where people screw up is they do everything all at once and wonder why they're not getting better at everything all at once. So there we go. That's my introduction. I usually try to take about five minutes as we get questions coming in. So if you have questions, send them and I will answer them. And if I miss them because you know, I can't stay out here all day answering questions. Um, send them to me. I'll, I will answer them. Uh, whether you post them in the, um, you know, YouTube channel or Facebook page, or you uh, uh, send them to me by DM or IM or email, I will answer them. Um, so bring them, bring them on. Okay. So what's a good pace intensity progression? For a beginner runner, when I started, I would try to do a six minute mile pace and ended up with shin splints because of that. Um, you know, it may not be your pace that's causing shin splints. You know, it could be just the fact that you're running, period, is causing shin splints. Could be a technique issue, could be crap shoes, could be the ground that you're running on, could be the way that you're running. So there's a lot of things that come into shin splint issues. Um, I have an article. And I will put the article in here. Um, in fact, maybe I can even answer it in the middle of this. It's called Recurring Shin Splints over on military.com. And then I have another one I'll post in here as well uh, from one of our doctors that works out with us, uh, doctor of physical therapy that has a really good system of helping people get over shin splints. But you know, for a beginner runner, you know, I do have beginner running programs that can help you uh, not get injured. You just have to um, not bite off too much all at once because that's where people screw up. In fact, I'm posting this one in here as well. Um, and I will post them in the, the descriptions of, the, of this video too. Um, but yeah. It's, it has nothing to do with probably the speed. It's usually five different other things that all combine into making you have shin splints. You know, like I said earlier, it's volume. It's usually the number one. Um, but too much, too fast, too soon um, is typically a shin splint issue. And if you're young, you're still growing, your bones are still soft. Your bones are still growing. It's stretching out all these ligaments and tendons. And, you know, you're just susceptible to shin splints. Um, I think I quit getting shin splints at age 20, 21 when I quit growing. Um, but I would get them, you know, every other, every other year, you know, just from doing too much too soon. Um, yeah, but check out that beginner running program. That's probably going to get you a better um, better foundation for you. And mix in some non-impact cardio activities. A lot of people, you, know, you don't have to run to get in good shape. You know, you can hop in the pool or get on a bike, elliptical, stair stepper, rowing machine. 
all of those are good ways to get the heart and lungs ready for when your legs are ready to uh, be able to run. Um, okay, John says, currently at 903 swim, nine minute run, good. 90 sit-ups, 68 push-ups, 16 pull-ups. Um, do 60 push-ups in the first minute, and then I fall off. What do you? You're just out of push-up shape. I mean, there's no reason why you can't one day double that in two minutes. Um, I've seen 120 push-ups in two minutes before. I've seen people get 80 push-ups in one minute um, as well. <clears throat> Uh, and then get another 20 or 30 in the next minute. So, you know, I, I don't think you are doing anything wrong with that. I just think you just need to work on your muscle stamina a little bit and make sure you're just doing your push-ups regularly. I would slowly start to increase your volume um, in push-ups um, and work to where you are really pushing. Uh, during the winter lift cycle, a lot of my guys got better at push-ups by doing this. They would do bench press. Let's say we were doing eight reps of, you know, 75% of your body weight, whatever that was, right? And that eighth rep was getting pretty tough. You still got it, but you probably couldn't have gotten nine. Then as soon as you're done, you rack it, you roll over on your belly, and you do as many push-ups as you can. And you'll be shocked that you can only do like four or five, maybe 10 max, but it's a good way to test out that um, almost that like feels like the last 15 seconds of a push-up test where you almost got nothing left. You don't necessarily need to fail, but you just want to push it until you're really fatiguing. And that's going to push that little envelope where you're struggling to get more reps later in that two minute time push-up test. So try that, try mixing push bench press and push-ups together. Um, go pretty hard on the bench until you don't quite fail. But if you tried one more, you would probably fail and then go right into push-ups right after and just see how many you can do. Um, as you get better at push-ups, you'll be able to do 10, 15, maybe even 20 because you got a little bit of juice left in you and you got some muscle stamina created. When you first start out, you might only get three or five before you just fall flat on your stomach. Um, give that a shot. That's a really good one. Um, everybody's claimed that was probably the best help all winter. Um, so even though we focused on strength, we still mix in some calisthenics on that, on that back end just to maintain and get a little bit better at those calisthenics too. So let's see. It's my beagle talking to me. Um, here's another one from Pierre Michael. Um, let's see. Hello, Stu. What would you? What would be the optimal amount of running pace kilometers per week to progress on while progressing on strength as well? Okay, if you're going to run during a strength cycle, you don't want to run too much. But I will say this, since we were lifting weights outside, we ran more than we normally do this past strength cycle just to stay warm because it was cold. It'd be 25 degrees outside when we're lifting and that kind of sucks. So we'd want to stay warm. So we were running quarter miles pretty much in between every set of bench press or squats or deadlifts and things like that. Um, so it accumulated. So. Um, my suggestion would be this, whatever your peak is, cut that back at least 50 to 75%. So for instance, we will run in the summer, we'll get up to 30 to 35 miles in a week. Some guys might get 40 um, in a week, but usually in the winter, we'll drop it down to about 10 to 15 miles per week. So give that a, give that a shot. Uh, let's see here. Do you think going from a shoe like Hoka, Hoka 
with tons of support and cushion to eventually a boot in the pipeline will with much less cushion is a recipe to get injured. Um, well, it depends on what pipeline you're on, because if you go to Bud's, those boots are like air boots. They are running boots. They're made by Nike. They're called the Nike Combat Gen 2. Um, running in those is not like running in Vietnam era combat boots like I used. Those sucked. Um, these are much different. <clears throat> Probably the only thing that you know makes them a boot is they go above your ankle, you know, give you better ankle support. But they are meant to be run in. So it depends on what um, pipeline you're talking about. I'm not sure what the army issues for their boots, but that might be an issue. So I would suggest, <clears throat> I would suggest before you go, maybe five or six months before you are going to your training, um, build up to about 50% of your running in shoes, 50% in boots. I think that is a healthy way to do it to where you break in your boots while you're running, but you're also not doing too much boot running to where you get injured prior to it. <clears throat> um, so that, that is what most of my guys do. They'll run in shoes about half the time. Uh, and then when we run on the beach, they run in boots or we run trails, they run in boots. Uh, but when we're on pavement, we tend to run in uh, regular running shoes just just for safety, uh, mainly. Uh, let's see. Hello, Stu. On a strength cycle, would using endurance style active recovery like push-ups end up unintentionally mixing energy systems in a strength hypertrophy cycle? Um I don't think so. I don't think it's that big a deal. Um, put it this way. Every day when we do, let's say we're doing, like today, we did upper body day. We warmed up with um, a 100-yard run, which some of that's dynamic stretches, and a pull-up and push-up pyramid, 1 to 10. So you do one push-up, one pull-up, run 100 yards, mix in some dynamic stretches. Two, two, run 100 yards, three, three, run 100 yards, go up to 10 and stop. So it's a total of 55 push ups, 55 pull ups as a warm up before we go into heavier bench or military press or, you know, weighted pull ups and things like that. So I typically would recommend using calisthenics as a warm up or a cool down in between your heavier lifts. And it works out real well. And besides, pull-ups are the heavy lift exercise of the calisthenics world. And dips. It's 100% of your body weight focused on uh, that movement uh, when you're doing dips or you're doing pull-ups. <clears throat> so, you know, the heavier you are, the harder they are. So, um, you know, th those are kind of a mix Um heavy weight exercise and um, calisthenic, you know, pull-ups are harder than pull-downs, for instance, right? But bench press is harder than push-ups, depending on the weight. So it's, it's not a bad idea to mix it in there. And I'm, I'm not really... Um, not really sure that that matters, to be honest with you. Uh, I've just seen progress with adding push-ups at the end of a bench press and adding pull-downs after pull-ups, right? Just to kind of top off your, um, your reps. Is my streamline as important as Seal Swick makes it seem? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I wrote an article about about that. In fact, I'm going to put it in here right here. In fact, the title of this article is Streamline or Swimming Streamline, number one most important skill for speed swimming. And I am going to place that into the comment section. 
Um, yes, it is extremely important. If you screw up your streamline, you're just working harder. So, so another one I've heard, strength cycles are generally shorter in duration compared to hypertrophy. Can you recommend a time frame to keep in mind? Um, I mean, you can mix both of them. You know, do a hypertrophy cycle, then do a strength cycle, you know, back to back, and then go into more of a calisthenics cardio cycle. That's what I would do. If you need to put on weight, go hypertrophy first, get those bigger muscles stronger, and then give yourself a little break from your strength cycle and go into more calisthenics and cardio uh, just to work on your muscle stamina. And then come back around to hypertrophy if you need to keep putting on bigger muscles. <clears throat> Typically, it, it's seasonal. You know, if, if I think the perfect um, amount of time is the 12 to 13 weeks that is spring, summer, fall, and winter. You know, that is why I have this seasonal tactical fitness periodization program, which I will quickly put it into the comment section. I will also put these in the description of the of the video as well, so you don't have to go hunting through the comment section. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's perfect timing. I would say 12 weeks of anything is just about enough to make you say, whew, I need to change. And uh, that's kind of where we are right now with the winter lift cycle. One, I'm excited because today was 40 degrees while we worked out versus 25 degrees. Um, but also excited that um, just changing things up and ready. everybody's ready to start adding on some miles and working some calisthenics a little harder. Let's see, how often should we run your push-up program in conjunction with other cycles? So you're talking probably like my push-up push. I don't recommend it very often. Um, it's not something you do multiple times ever. You know, do it once or twice, you know, in a year. And that that's it. You know, eventually you don't need it. You know, eventually you'll be good enough at push-ups where you don't need to do the push-up program. The push-up program is 10 days of uh, five times your current max. So let's say you can do 40 push-ups. That means you multiply your max times five. That's 200. Um, and you do 200 push-ups every day for 10 days straight, right? If you can do 80, you know, there's some debate whether or not you really need that program because 400 push-ups a day for 10 straight days might be pretty challenging and you might overdo it and not see any progress. So just kind of depends where you are on that spectrum of good or not so good. You can definitely get better in two weeks, but you don't want to do it so often that you're just plateauing or getting worse. So there, there's a fine line between that one, improvement and overtraining. So you got to watch out for that. Besides, push-ups are just one factor of so many things that you need to work on. And it's probably not one of the most important ones of all. You know, running, I would say, is probably more challenging than push-ups. Unless you're a cross-country guy. Could be a different story. So it depends on you. <clears throat> I would not do daily push-ups for a very long period. You know, if you're going to do daily push-ups, max it out at two weeks at the most. Otherwise, you're just going to do more harm than good. <clears throat> but the, the best way to do it is I have a workout called the classic EST week. Um, and it is a great way to do training that is not daily push-ups. It is every other day push-ups mixing in a, uh, a pyramid, a superset, and a max rep set program into your training every week. So like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday, if you need another day. Um, and uh, let's see, it's a good one. I just put a link in there for it. So it's all good to go. So let's see, 
what would you recommend for a 38 year old non-athlete that is an amateur runner and I can easily run 10 to 15 kilometers as a regular running training frequency? Um, 10 to 15 kilometers, you're looking at, what's that, uh, seven, eight miles? Is that in one run or a week? Um, it just depends. I mean, you doing that every day would be a lot of running. You doing it every other day, not so bad. Um, it just depends. You know, how much do you weigh? Um, do you have any non-impact cardio activity that you could also do? Um you know, because if you did that every day, you're looking at 50 miles a week. If you did it every other day, you're looking at 20 to 24 miles a week. Regardless, the logical progression to running is about a 10 to 15 percent increase in your total volume every week. So let's say you're just running 10 or 15 kilometers a week. You only do it once a week. My suggestion is do it every other day, cut that so where you're doing maybe 11 or 16 kilometers in a week, uh, but you're running more frequently uh, and then pick up that volume at a 10 to 15 percent increase every week. Um, if you follow that article that I just sent about beginner running program, you can see exactly what I'm talking about, because you then you can mix in some sprint days you can mix in some goal pace days you can mix in some long slow distance days you can mix in some non-impact cardio days which i highly recommend if you're an amateur runner or kind of new to running or overweight because that's just going to bring on more injuries you know the harder you hit the ground because you are heavier the more impact injuries you're going to bring to yourself all right let's see joseph says for those Competing for a SOAS slot, besides having great PST scores, what would you really emphasize that they wanted if they wanted an invitation? What would you tell your guys at either Academy, ROTC, and OCS? Same thing I've told them for years is they will look at the big picture, but yes, they will look at your PST scores first. Your PST scores get you in the door, or I should say get your foot in the door. Everything else, your grades, your leadership, um, uh, leadership experience, community service, uh, your job, if you have any job skills, you know, all, you know, language skills, all of those things come into play for making the complete person when they actually pick you to come. They'll say, oh, wow, he's a great student. He knows two languages. And you know, he's got good PST scores as well. You know, that that means a lot. So they're going to look at everything. So just get good at everything because it is competitive. Um, does this physical therapist have a place to ask any questions? Sure. Oh, you're talking about the one that works out with us? Um, I could have him on sometime. I, he does not do social media. Uh, let's see. What is your favorite beer? I remember reading your study almost decades ago, about two or three drinks a day can help longevity due to stress reduction. Um, yeah, moderate alcohol consumption it has to be moderate. I mean, two to three. Some people would say that's a lot. Some people would say that's moderate. You know, I think the definition of moderate is different depending on one, what country you're from, if you're male or female. Um, so I personally might drink one a week now. I just don't drink a whole lot. Um, so um, I personally like this one German beer called Maisel's Hefeweizen. Um, when I went to Germany, I became a beer snob. Now, I will drink other beers, too. You know, free beer is my favorite beer. Uh, but um, best tasting, Maisel's, Hefeweizen. Um, oh, it's delicious. Really good. Um, but, yeah, 
I would say um, two to three is a little bit too much for me. If I did that, I'd be big as a house because you got to also consider that you're putting in about another 500, 600 calories if you're doing that much. And that, that can really interfere with you trying to maintain a certain body weight, right? How long after LASIK can you get a contract? Six months. Next question. Any advice for us older guys? 27 going to NSW, recovery being around younger guys, how you're treated. You know, I, we had some older guys in my buds class and I, they were just so hard that, you know, it was just fun to have them around. Um, you know, they were a student just like anybody else. Um, you know, they didn't do a lot of the stupid banter that would occur, you know, between 18 year olds. Um, they were just more squared away, focused. It was part of the day. It was just business. So I enjoyed it. Now they did, uh, they did spend a lot more time focusing on recovery. They would stretch every day, which I tried to get everybody to do um, together, at least the boat crew together to stretch a little bit after, talk about the day, talk about tomorrow's schedule, make sure we got all the right equipment and everything all together um, when, I was, uh, when I was a boat crew leader, um, at least in first phase. And then, uh, but yeah, it, it wasn't. I don't really have any advice other than, I mean, the same advice I'd give anybody else is just everybody has to focus on recovery, you know, your sleep, what you eat, what you drink, um, your stretching, your foam rolling, you know, massaging, not massage tools, all of those will come in handy. So ice compression, all that will ver be very helpful. So Learn as many recovery tools as possible. In fact, I've written an article on the topic. Recovery, you know, training systems, everything from, oh yeah, that's a good one. So um, put this in the, uh, in the comment section, but I'll also put it in the description of the, uh, of the video as well. Everyone look up muscle scraping as a form of myofascial release and has fixed my shin splints. Nice. I have not done any scraping, but I do have some scraping tools that I have considered using, but I haven't really needed them. So i uh, saving them for when I do. But yeah, good. Glad that worked for you. Um, what's the reasoning behind the different rep ratios? For example, pull-ups, push-ups, squats, sit-ups. One, two, three versus one, 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 one for an example. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. So like the PT pyramid, um, I personally think pull-ups are probably the hardest of all those exercises. So they're a one. So if you do a one, 10, one pyramid, that equals a hundred reps. However, push-ups are too easy to just do a hundred. So I double those. Sometimes I triple them. Um, abs or squats, um, same times three, get 300 reps of that. You know, it's nothing different. It's similar to a Murph. So you do 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, uh, 300 squats in a Murph. You know, if you add that to a pull-up pyramid, it's a one, two, three multiplied time. Um, yeah, good good question though. The reason is behind, I, I think times one's too easy for some exercises, but it's times two is too hard for some exercises. Like to do a times two pull-up pyramid is pretty tough to do 200 pull-ups in a workout. If you're doing a 110 one, if you keep going up, you're obviously a little more advanced and you can handle a 110 one. But most people can't handle the full 110 one as it is. Um, if you can, go higher. Go 115 one. That's 225 pull-ups at a times one. Pretty good little workout. So, by the way, on the pyramid, cool little fact, if you go up and you only do the top number once and you come back down, all you have to do to figure out your reps is square that top number. So, if you go 110 to 1, you've done 100. If you go 19 to 1, you've done 81. Um, and then if you do a times 2 times 3, you just double it or triple it, whatever that number is. So, fun fact. Okay. 
Just recently got access to a pool and been doing the 50-50 past month. When should I incorporate fins? Um, I would start incorporating fins. Just do it on leg days. So you can still do the 50-50s with fins. You need to get used to swimming with fins eventually. So uh, we just do them on leg days. So two days a week, we will put on a pair of fins and swim for, you know, try to swim for 30 minutes without stopping. See how far you get. You know, once that gets easy, see if you can swim for 45 minutes, see if you can swim for an hour. You know, eventually when you get to Bud, you'll be doing two mile ocean swims and that's two nautical miles. So that's 4,000 yards of swimming. Um, and if you're fast, you'll get it done in about 70 minutes. Um, I think first phase time you got until 85 minutes, but depending on the currents that can slow you down, push you or, um, push against you or push, make you not go straight, which will also add in time. So I think if you can maintain your pace and keep it at that yard per second, um, in the pool, that'd be really helpful for you for taking it in the ocean because it will probably add about 10 minutes to you in the ocean. So we try to get 4,000 yards and 4,000 seconds, you know, roughly if you can do uh, if you can do 4,000 yards in 60, 65 minutes, that's really good. And then go outside into the ocean and it might be 70, 75 minutes. For those of us with ITBS, what do you advise guys to relieve pain before, during, and after a runs? Can you effectively train through it, grow out of it by lifting heavy as well? Um... Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know about lifting too heavy with it. Uh, that could aggravate it a little bit, but running can aggravate it too. Also, swimming with big scuba fins can aggravate it. So my suggestion is this. Um, make sure you warm up really well because typically during your run, you can, it's a tendonitis. So if you can warm that up really well, it becomes a little more pliable. So it may not hurt during your run. It may hurt a little bit before. And it will definitely hurt afterwards. So my advice is this. Um, and I've done this several times, especially when foam rollers first came out, was just foam rolled and did some warm-ups before I ran. Went ahead and ran, didn't have any problems. Uh, after I ran, would do another session of foam rolling, um, just to kind of work out some of the, the tightness in it. And um, maybe a massage tool get in there with a massage tool too, um, like a car buffer or one of those little Theraguns. And, um, and then after that, you know, where it hurts is, you know, put a little compression sleeve around the knee, see how that feels. Um, or maybe ice later, you know, some people say ice isn't that effective anymore. I used to ice it and use compression all the time. Um, Made it feel better temporarily. Um, probably wasn't part of healing that that much, but I will say this: I was able to continue running during running cycle versus have to stop. And before I even heard of a foam roller, like back in the '90s, I would have to stop. So I personally would say, from my experience, you can still run if you take care of your warm ups and your cool downs with some dynamic stretches some static stretches, and some foam rolling. That's how I've gotten through IT band. I, I will say this. If I had known what a foam roller was in the 90s, when I went through Buds in 91, 92, um, I probably would not have been rolled third phase because I could have gotten through the day um, having that foam roller. Now, obviously, that's speculation. I don't know. Uh, let's see. My school doesn't have a wrestling team, but my town has jujitsu or judo. Yeah, sure. Those are great. Nothing wrong with any martial art. You just have to be careful that it doesn't interfere with your training. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, breaking your hand or a joint or you know, doing martial arts can affect how you train for the next couple of months. So if you're leaving for boot camp or for something in the pipeline, 
know, probably the last thing you want to do four to six months out is potentially dangerous activities such as um, any martial art, um, MMA, you know, any fighting. Um, and even if you're a triathlete, you know, riding a bike, you know, on roads where there are cars, you know, I've seen guys get clipped, you know, by a car and break a leg and, you know, their timeline to go to buds is significantly changed because of that. Um, same for guys fighting and break a hand. One guy popped his elbow. Uh, one guy had an ankle lock on him that messed up his ankle for four months. Um, couldn't run or swim for four months. So, I mean, you have to just understand with extra activities come, you know, injuries potentially. So I tend to try to get guys, especially three to four months away from shipping away from those kind of dangerous activities, just because I've seen it so many times where people screwed up and got hurt and their dreams were um, either delayed or shattered like one of their bones. What's a solid benchmark four mile time run to aim for, for pre buds. Um, I try to get all my guys down to 28 minutes, a uh, seven minute mile, pretty easy. So there's two paces you need to learn. You need to learn a six minute mile pace for shorter timed runs, like a mile and a half and two mile timed runs. If you're army, um, three mile timed runs, if you're uh, Marine Corps trying to get 18 minutes, tough test for the average Marine. Um, and uh, a seven minute mile for four, five or six mile timed runs. So if you can do five miles in 35 minutes, good job. Um, typically that will put you a few minutes under the uh, minimum standard, uh, which is where you want to be anyway. You don't want to be flirting with that minimum standard at all. So 28 minutes, easy, not as a gut check, because you're not going to be able to gut check every day. So you want to be able to run 28 mini minutes, seven minute mile, easy day, four to five miles. Even when you don't feel good, you can still run a seven minute mile. So that takes some conditioning. <clears throat> I had ankle injuries, a recent inversion, eversion, ankle sprain in jujitsu. How many days a week would you program strength and stability? Um, at least a couple days a week. Um, you, you'll find, too, that once your ankle gets a little better, just swimming with fins is a great strengthening and mobility exercise for your ankles. So um, that's, a, that's a great one. You'll, you'll get your ankles a lot stronger. By, uh, by swimming with fins. So, but yeah, I, I would just add it as, you know, anytime you're doing legs, add some ankles, right? Um, and some stability work. Would you recommend CSS or breaststroke for someone who wants to go recon? How often should I swim and tread in clothes? Yeah, you know, that recon test is legit. If you're not used to swimming with camis, it is a rude awakening the first time you ever do it. So practice swimming in camis. Now, the good news is you can you don't have to wear your boots. Um, you wear a tight fitting pair of camis. Um, I would make sure your pockets are closed uh, so no water gets in there and acts like a parachute. Um, but I, I would do that a couple of days a week at least. Uh, just because it's so hard. Um, I, I would do both strokes because you're going to get tired doing breaststroke and you're going to get tired doing CSS. You can't do freestyle with that swim. So I would get good at maybe not just the CSS, but the elementary side stroke where you can actually, you know, there, there's an old saying called grab an apple, put it in the basket. So it, it's you're on your side the whole time and your face is out of water. So you can actually breathe the whole time. If you do a Google search on elementary side stroke, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a really good one for camis. In fact, I teach a lot of the Army guys 
to learn that one um, to get across the pool when they do their uh, 50 meter gear swim. Um, breaststroke's fine too for that one, but you definitely want to be able to breathe a lot because you're going to be putting out, because um, you're almost swimming diagonally. You know, when you got that much clothes on, you know, you're not very streamlined in the water swimming flat. You're kind of swimming this way. So it, you, you need to breathe more. You're going to get very, very winded. So good question. It's a good test, man. That's a good little gut check. See, I'm 22 working out to become a SEAL. I'm going to need a couple of years. Am I getting started too late? No. I mean, I was going through buds at 22, but we had 24, 25 year olds in our class. And they lasted a lot longer than the 18-year-olds. So usually our whole class, I thought, was nothing but 18-year-olds until about week three. And we had about five left. So, no, that's fine. Any advice for breathing while doing CSS and keeping gold pace for longer? Um, you know what? There's an article I wrote called Pool Breathe, Kick Glide, One Mississippi, Two Mississippi Pool. Um, I want you to read that. I'm going to put it right here in the comment section. Um, and there's another one called, Dude, You're Not in Swimming Shape. Classic. If you're having a hard time breathing while you're swimming, you're just not in swimming shape. So there is a way, yes, you exhale underwater, you turn to breathe, you don't pop up to breathe. All of that is covered in both of those articles. So check out that article on the CSS. Let's see. Any more questions? Alternative to treading water if you don't have a deep end. You know what? I've never been able to um, answer that question. Other than, you know, you don't have to be like stretched out you know, treading water like this, you can bend your knees and tread water. Um, especially the egg beater is actually, you're almost sitting in a chair doing an alternating breaststroke kick. So you're, if you're a six foot tall, you don't need six feet of water to tread. You could do that in probably three and a half or four, maybe four. Um, so consider that one other one is uh i don't know try to find a pool near you that has a little bit deeper water maybe it might even be a hotel pool you know that uh, you can hop hop in go do some treading in fact you know when i go to hotel pools um they're usually so small that i can't do any workouts as far as swimming because i just kick right across the pool off the wall so i just tread for the workouts and um, treading is vertical swimming. The sooner you learn that, the better. Um, and if you think treading's easy, you should practice it and see if you can do it for 10 minutes. Um, I call 10 minutes of treading equivalent to 500 yards of swimming. It feels about the same. So it's pretty legit. Um, get some degree of dryness in my throat. After 800 meters of swimming, yet it doesn't stop me from completing the thousand. Of some t dryness in your throat, so not sure. I mean, maybe it's a mix of um, chlorine air that might be aggravating your throat. Um, maybe try changing swimming pools. See if it matters. See if it changes. Right, if you change pools from an indoor pool to an outdoor pool, um, that may change things up. Um, if you have that ability to do that. Uh, but if you're from an arid environment, let's say you have a swimming pool in the middle of the desert um, and the air's real dry around you, swimming hard is going to um, definitely dehydrate you. And you will probably get uh, some dry mouth, um, dry throat issues just because the air is so dry. But I, I think you'll find that if you find a humid area to swim in, when the air is a little bit more moist, um, you won't have the same issues. I'm kind of guessing there. But 
I would say that may be an issue there for you. Uh, David Goggins, 4x4x48, four by four by a good mental challenge. Yes, it's 100% mental. I mean, it's four miles of running every four hours for 48 hours. That kind of sucks. Um, it's a lot of mileage. So if you're not used to running that mileage, it's also potentially stupid uh, because you're probably going to wind up injuring yourself. So you got to remember, there's a fine line between mental toughness and stupidity, right? Where are you on that line, right? If you don't run much and you decide you're going to do the four by four for 48 hours, probably not a good idea. You know, I would probably at least have 25, 30 miles a week under my belt long before I would attempt uh, that kind of mileage all up, you know, in a two day period. Just my advice. Any advice for balancing training and school? Currently, I'm doing your tactical fitness program, getting ready for the PST after I graduate college. Um, yeah, you know, I remember being a student and mixing in a sport on top of prepping for spec ops. And the way we would do it would be we get up in the morning before school, go do our run and PT, um, try to squeeze in a swim somewhere in the day if that was possible. We go to rugby practice afterwards. And then on the way back, if we couldn't squeeze in a swim, we would go squeeze in a swim um, before we studied the rest of the evening. So that was kind of our pretty regimented schedule. Um, didn't allow for a whole lot of uh, off time uh, for sure. So it, it can be done though. You just may, you just may have to break up some of your um, workouts into a couple of different uh, sessions. All right. A couple more questions. Uh, if I had ortho scopic uh, labrum surgery a couple of years ago and my shoulder's 100% now, would I still be able to get through MEPS? Yes. I will say this. Back in the 90s, a labrum tear was a death sentence. You would not even be able to join the military, let alone spec ops. Now, surgeries have gotten so much better. They can do it orthoscopically. They can fix those things. It's amazing. Um, we just recently had a guy with two labrum tear surgeries go two buds, get through buds, and he's a SEAL now. So I wouldn't worry about it. You just got to make sure you have all your paperwork from your surgeon, not only your surgeon notes, your doctor notes, your physical therapy notes, and of course your PST scores have to reflect that your shoulder doesn't um, prevent you from scoring well. Um, all right, a couple more questions. Best way to simulate no course. You know, I have a great little workout and it has to do with the pyramid as well. It is a pull-up and burpee pyramid. In fact, if you, if you Google search, simulate obstacle course Stu Smith workout. Here's how I do it. Um, if you think about what an obstacle course is, you got to climb over stuff, you got to crawl, you got to push, push through some stuff, you know, whatever. Um, here's the way you do it. You get an outdoor pull-up bar or an indoor pull-up bar with a place to run is fine. Uh, outdoor pull-up bar with about 25 to 50 yards to run in between. Um, and do this. You do one pull up, run 25 yards, do do one burpee, run back, do two pull ups, two burpees, three, three, four, four, work your way up. Now, eventually you're going to want to change the way you travel. So you can low crawl, you can bear crawl, you can fireman carry, you can uh, broad jump, you can uh, farmer walk. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do the uh do the travels back and forth. Uh, you got a partner, you can do wheelbarrow carries or, you know, piggyback, you know, whatever. Just get creative and change up your transitions uh, to and from, and it just makes it harder. Uh, but that's a good way to simulate the same way of, you know, how you run in between obstacles, and then you got to exert yourself up and over that obstacle or through it or under it. It's a good way to do that. So that's how we do it. That's how we've been doing it for years. Uh, luckily, we have an obstacle course where we train. So that makes that makes it a little bit easier. Um, what's the best way to train to get that seven-minute mile pace you're talking about in a four-minute mile? All right. So I am going to, once again, send you one of these articles here. 
and then I'm going to go because my house is getting noisy. All right. So check out the article in there. It's a uh, running plan. Uh, it builds you up to like 20 miles, or I shouldn't say it builds you up. You need to build up to 20 miles a week of running and then do four miles um, time your work on your pace at that seven minute pace. So when you see go mile pace, so at a four at a 40 or 800 meter pace, you should, or a distance, you should be running, see 145 will get you a seven minute mile, a 330, 800 will get you a seven minute mile. Start learning that pace, right? And make it so that's easy. So you run a quarter mile in a minute 45, minute 40, minute 45. Um, you're in the zone to learn what that seven minute mile feels like. And then you can just get good at it. And eventually the quarters are easy. The 800s are easy. The miles are easy. Then you're running a mile and a half, two miles at seven minute pace. Then you're running three and four miles at seven minute pace. Take some time, but it works. If you take a look at that running plan I just posted up here, you'll see it. So I am going to go. It's almost lunchtime here. It's a little noisy here. So I got a bail. So anyway, you guys um, check out. Um, let's see what I got for you today for listening. Um, if you guys see this down below, military code one five, uh, save fifteen percent at stewsmithfitness.com If you're looking at any type of programs, so we're changing into our spring training. So we got a spring and summer training cycle as well as a calisthenics and cardio cycle that has a beginner intermediate section in it as well. Both of those are really good. So with that. I'm going to take off and uh, I will chat with you next week. Have a good one.